So, uh, a warm welcome to the 111th Global Health History Seminar, which we co-organize along uh, with our partners in the WHO European office, where this uh, WHO initiative is based. And my thanks to them for their support for all the events, but their support for this event to happen in New York, which allows us to involve uh, uh, two very dear colleagues from Fio Cruz uh, and our own Joan Nunez, who's a newly minted senior lecturer. He just got promoted to senior lecturer at the University of York. Uh, we're also very grateful to the Wellcome Trust, whose support for many, many years has allowed us to reach this landmark of 111 Global Health History Seminars, which is a series that uh, seeks to bring together academics, policymakers, and activists. Uh, many of these seminars result in very e effective long-term collaborations across sectors. Some of them are less successful, but we always make sure that interesting, nice people meet each other uh, and, and keep in touch. So today our theme is Zika. And without further ado, I want to very quickly uh, introduce you to our two wonderful visitors and the academics from Fio Cruz. Um, speaking first will be Professor Nisia Trinidad Lima, who's the president of the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation and who's also a medical sociologist, whose work I got to know of in 2003. And it's wonderful if you want to uh, read up about uh, notions of race uh, in relation to Amazonian populations and how that was built into discourses of mainstream Brazilian nationalism. It's available open access in the American Journal of Public Health, so do, do follow, follow up. Gustavo Mata is senior researcher at the National Public Health School in Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. I have known him uh, for a shorter period of time, but it's still been a great privilege to be uh, aware of his work. And he has been very active in the Zika network, uh, and he's going to draw upon that work today. And Joao, of course, our Joao Nunes, has been working with all of them on this network and contributed to it richly, and so he will also draw on the research that has come out of it. We have another colleague, Denise, from Fio Cruz, sitting uh, amongst the myths. She won't be speaking today, but I hope she will ask questions and participate in the general discussion. So I shall now move away, and you can listen to the people you've come to listen uh, good to. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank Sandroy very much to Sandroy Batacharya. Uh, João Nunes, uh, people from York University, the support of uh, Welcome Trust, my colleagues at Fio Cruz. Uh, the idea of my presentation is just to give uh, an overview about some as aspects about the role of uh, Fio Cruz in the context of the sanitary emergency of Zika virus. In November of 2015, as a result of the dramatic increase in cases of microcephalia in the northeast of the country, the Brazilian Ministry of Health declared the existence of a public health emergency of national importance. The decree aims the urgent use of measures of prevention, risk control, and containment damage and harm to public health. So, uh, this is the map of Zika infection, infection in Brazil from 2014 to, to 2016. We can see uh, the very expressive position of Northeast in the beginning. Uh, the Pending of the epidemic during these years. Two months later, oh, here uh, we can see how uh, the epidemic grew from 2015-2016 and the uh, very important impact, especially in northeast region, 
There are historical studies about this. There, there, there are epidemiological studies going on, but it was a very dramatic case, especially the case of microcephaly, yeah. uh, who, uh, who, were, who were identified as uh, impact of Zika virus, not first in Brazil, but the scale, uh, the way of pay attention for the problem occurred because of this increasing number of microcephaly in Brazil. Two months later, so WHO officially recognized the global significance of the Zika outbreak and its possible relationship to the microcephaly enhancement, declaring public health emergence of internal, international concern. In February, during her visit to the country, her, as you can see in the picture, uh, it was a visit uh, for Brazil, and there was a visit at Fiocruz. This photograph is about Fiocruz with the health minister at that time and the former president of Fiocruz, Paulo Gadelha. Dr. Margaret Chan, general director of the organization, affirmed Brazil's central role in solving the problems generated by the Zika epidemic. This is, was not mere rhetoric, as in spite of the economical and political crisis and of graveness of the public health scenario, Brazil has become the most effective protagonist in confronting the epidemic. This was possible through the vigor of scientific production and the configuration of the Brazilian health system, a public health system, universal system, created by the Constitution of 1988 with the call after redemocratization and an intense social movement for healthy reform. You can imagine, uh, yesterday we had the first turn of the elections in Brazil, so we are now in a very uh, crucial moment. Think about the future of democracy, public health system, and Brazilian society. The health emergency in progress is connected with an urgent challenge to attuate global health in regard to characteristics common to other arboviruses, in particular vector control related to the increasing of social inequities in the devel developing countries. It's a complex enigma for science and technology, given the lack of insight into biological interactions, edge pathogens, immune response, clinical pathological manifestations, the lack of diagnostic instruments, and of preventions and therapies for what is referred to as congenital mal malformation and the Guillain-Barré syndrome, both of which are related by Zika virus, virus infection. So it's a complex problem, a scientific, a scientific challenge and a, a public health challenge and a social challenge. So the interdisciplinary approach as the Global Health Seminar proposes very important for this perspective. Uh, it's relevant to point out that in Brazil, the dramatic increase in microcephaly case and their possible, possible in correlation to the Zika virus infections were identified at a point in the system through the care of pregnant women at a hospital in the northeast of the country in the importance of the health family program in this point. It starts from the facts of these initial cases, it has been possible to activate a system of surveillance, science, and technology by integrating treatment, diagnosis, inspection, research, development, and the technological innovation, the Brazilian health system has been able to gauge the magnitude of the crisis, establish research protocols, and delineate innovation channels to enable a better understanding of the disease and just formulate strategies for protecting society. 
the existence of a national base that encompasses all these dimensions and that include important advances in the last few decades through the strengthening of the base care, the primary care, and family health strategies has been very important in that context. On the other hand, however, it is also a fact that a failure in vector control has caused Brazil to suffer from extensive epidemics of dengue since 1981. The relationship between these epidemics and the social and the environmental factors can be mainly in the urbanization model and the economic model adopted by the nation, which has created large population, population centers. These great concentrations of people have led to the lack of proper access to public services, such as sanitation, clear water, and living conditions. And these still are serious issues for the pub public policy agenda in the country. It is in leading the struggle for this group of challenges that few clues as a strategic institution of, of the health ministry came into play in organizing institutional response to the current emergency at that time, as well as contributing to short and, and long-term solutions. Fiocruz has been directly involved with, and you can see in the, at this slide, uh, the first genetic sequence of the Zika virus linked to, the, to microcephaly proving placenta transmission and pathological effects on the placenta, proving that effects on the fetus can take place during its entire gestation in the detection of the active virus in saliva and urine, and in the development of a triviral diagnostic kit for the acute phase that is able to detect Zika, Dengue, and Chikungunya infections, in the development of biolive sites, in new methods of vector control, uh, such as inf infect mosquitoes with the Wolbachia bacteria, and in the technique of dispersing live sites. Uh, this project, uh, the, project the project Wolbachia bacteria, Aes aegypti com Wolbachia, is at the, the slide, is an important project developed by Fiocruz with the uh, sponsor of many institutions, uh, Gates Foundation, Health Minister, and many other agencies. It's very important because have a sustainable method, method to control the, the Aedes aegypti. And, uh, this project has a very important dimension of population engagement, social engagement for the success of this initiative. Why these contributions have been added to a group of actions made by the national and the international community to reduce the perplexity of the beginning of the epidemic, at the same time they review new questions. Now we have no doubt that Zika virus causes congenital malformations, syndrome, and that the Aedes aegypti is the main transmission vector. However, we cannot assume that there are not cofactors or other vectors, nor that there is not the possibility of the role of other possible alternative sources of infections. We can discuss it during this seminar, of course, or other sources of infections, the sexual transmission, as you know, and many other problems. The nature of the interactions with the other arboviroses and the immunological response is still unknown and there is some evidence of subacute manifestations. The answers of too many of these questions require installed scientific capacity and the regular policies for science, technology, and innovation, as well as proper conditions in what is referred to as research material. Each is well known that Brazil 
has a significant number of cases and thus the genetic material capable of generating reference for the contribution of serology panels for test validation and for the development of vaccines. It is also where there is a structure for organizing multicentric clinical research in various regions. In this case, Fiocruz, as well as various other Brazilian institutions, institutions can provide a very significant response. Fiocruz work together in a long-term process, not only with the research teams, but also in help construct a national productive base that enables the country to be able to respond to the demands of the population and of the Brazilian health system. The Zika virus public health emergency is, in the sense, a case, an important case, for thinking about the promotion of access to diagnostic tools, vector control technologies, or a vaccine that would be feasible for the entire population. Some points of great relevance that usually get secondary consideration in emergency situations are the social and environmental conditions that can decisively interfere in the genesis of vector uh, transmitted diseases. The big problem is what that through not dealing adequately with the structural problems, the search for focal solutions end up being much more costly. Recently, the WHO published a report that showed that in the case of dengue, the effects of the diseases could have been reduced by 90% through practical environmental initiatives. This process could not only take care of Zika infection, but a group of other problems and threats that come from this front. Many times we employ a short-term response without realizing that it's much more expensive and much more ineffective for population. Think about this process we created at Fiocruz, a uh, very in, uh, important initiative for us, that the Zika Social Science Network. The idea was to put together social scientists, epidemiologists, and establish also a dialogue with biomedical centers, biomedical scientists, to generate synergies among epidemiological, clinical, and bench studies in those focus, focused on the social and human dimensions of the health emergence. A, a second goal is to produce knowledge in an inter- and tr transdisciplinary way so that it can lead to innovations in the scientific, educational, political, and social field. Public engagement through the participation of social movement, movements, especially those women and children affected by Zika virus. In the Z Ciências Sociais Zika Network, uh, Gustavo will talk something about this better than me. Uh, it's important to point out, the, the, to highlight the importance of this uh, interdisciplinary approach and to think the social dimensions of uh, this epidemic who, besides his specific role, could show us many problems uh, uh, related to health conditions, social conditions, environmental conditions, behavior, and many other important themes. Uh, one point important to mention is the leadership of some researchers at Fiocruz in this process. 
uh, especially women scientists is an interesting point. Uh, one of them is Selina Turki. Selina coordinates a very interdisciplinary center at Fiocruz, but with collaboration with the Universidade Federal de Pernambuco and many other institutions, uh, discussing all the dimensions of the epidemic. Epidemic, Zika epidemic. And another important Brazilian scientist is Patricia Brasil, who is studying a cohort of women and the children and discussing many important dimensions of the infections by Zika virus. She detects the problem in the placenta and the possibility of transmission. And for this reason, he, she was the winner of the 2018 Christophe Merrier Prize uh, this year. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'd like to stress in in our approach the idea of put together uh, the scientific dimension in all the fields of knowledge, the health policies, and very important for us the civil society social movements. Uh, here I would like to highlight the role of the associations of women, uh, generally called mother's association. Uh, one of them, two of them are here, no? Germana and Vanessa. And uh, these associations have uh, a very important uh, role in this process because the public policy have to be thinking together them. And this, we had a very important workshop in July this year during the important conference of the Brazilian Public Health Association just to discuss the recommendations, the possible uh, po policy uh, public policies and how our institution can help besides other institutions and the other actors how to solve problems, not only Zika, the problem continue because the children uh, need attention, need care, and uh, need uh, public policies in a very sustainable way. So I think that the, the figure uh, tried to show uh, the importance of an uh, integrative, uh, a comprehensive vision about this problem of Zika and the other related problems. Certainly, Zika virus outbreak and its consequence is the tip of an iceberg. We need to face the broader questions that are central to the Brazilian health system, from its financing to the creation of its administrative models and the debates about the technological models. It is also important to discuss how to model the develop development of the country involving broader issues that take into account loss of life conditions and public health issues. In the context of global health, the themes that take precedence are related to the capacity of governance and the response of multilateral organs, especially the WHO. It is important to consider the diplomacy of research with its commitment to the immediate divulgation of results to be shared with the scientific community, the administrators of public health systems, and also the population. This ensuring the capacity of the production system to supply necessary needs to the population, as well as a commitment to share biological material based on the norms established by the countries for the development of research and products. 
the project of a society in the nation, the role of the state, a sustainable development model associated with the social demands present in the field of public health and the new international solidarity ethos will be the great determinants of our cap capacity to respond to the threats presented by Zika virus outbreaks and the other epidemics. Fiocruz is an important institution in the global health arena and plays a critical role to face scientific, political and social inequities and defending the fairness in science, technology and society. That's, I think that the, those are the main points I would like to share with you and I'd like to thank Obrigada. All right, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you also for those of us watching us via the video link. Um, exactly three years ago, on the 8th of October 2015, I had the pleasure and the honor to be at another Global Health History Seminar uh, when we gathered colleagues in uh, WHO Copenhagen to discuss what was then the big issue in the global health agenda at the time, which was the Ebola outbreak. And my argument on, on that day, exactly three years ago, was that Ebola was a neglected disease and continued to be a neglected disease throughout the duration of the outbreak and is still a neglected disease today. I won't go through the details of what I said then, but I'd only mention this now because when thinking about the Zika outbreak, a lot of the things that I discussed and that I reflected when looking at Ebola also rang true in the case of Zika. And what I want to do today is not so much um, address the public health response to Zika, particularly in Brazil, which was, the, after all, the epicenter of the outbreak. Uh, we've heard uh, Nisia uh, present some of the excellent work that was done by Fiocruz. Um, and of course, we all know, and Nisia also referred this towards the end of her presentation, the extent to which, uh, to a certain degree, Fiocruz and the, and the researchers working there were faced with an uphill struggle against the broader the limitations of the public health response on the part of the government and on the part of public health authorities. And what I want to do today is uh, investigate, use this public health response as a starting point and try to do a broader historical reflection, a big picture reflection about the, some what I consider to be the main dynamics cultural, political, economic, that explain the limitations of public health response to Zika, and at the same time establish parallels between what happened in the Zika response and what happened three years ago with the Ebola, of the response to the Ebola outbreak. So we all know that um, uh, in terms of the government response, governments in, in Latin America namely Brazil, but also other countries, uh, had their response was faced with a number of limitations. So we know that it was a very narrow framing of the outbreak that framed the, 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 the Zika outbreak overwhelmingly as a problem of mosquitoes, as a problem of vector control. We know that this narrow framing of Zika as a problem of mosquitoes overlooked or contributed to the, to the neglect, reproduced the neglect of a number of determinants of disease, something that uh, um, Nisia already mentioned, namely issues surrounding sanitation infrastructure, issues surrounding inequalities, issues surrounding um, inefficient and deficient urbanization, issues surrounding sexual and reproductive rights, of women in particular. So we know that there were a lot of issues that did not receive sufficient attention because the government response, and here I'm emphasizing the government response because there was a lot of people trying to counter this, as we know, for colleagues of Fiocruz, but the government response overwhelmingly focused or devoted the majority of its attention to mosquito control. So we know it was a very narrow uh, approach. We know that we forgot or neglected the determinants of disease. We also know, and we also come to realize now, as we tend to see the as we begin to see the uh, medium-term and long-term repercussions of this disease, we also begin to see now that it was a myopic 
governmental response, in the sense that it did not take into account the scale of the public health crisis, namely the, the medium-term and long-term repercussions of this crisis in terms of the children who were born with uh, different uh, ailments under the Zika congenital syndrome. One of them is microcephaly, but there are many others. So we also know that this, the, the, even the, the, the very narrow vector control response was on the ground riddled with tensions, riddled with problems of inefficiency. So there were a lot of difficulties in implementing vector control, which in a way connects with the historical difficulty that Brazil and other Latin American countries have faced with the control of vectors, of mosquito vectors, in the context of uh, mosquito-borne diseases. So what I want to do today, so we all know that it's all familiar, or, uh, to most of you is probably already familiar, but well, what I want to do today is inquire into the conditions of possibility of this response. Right? I want to establish and kind of broad, paint a broad picture of some historical trajectories that reveal underlying problems in global health that help to explain why the response was thus and why a broader engagement with the determinants of disease was not seen as desirable or natural or possible. Okay. So what I want to do this kind of reflection, and it will be slightly productive, provocative in line with, uh, with uh, the spirit, I think, of these global health history seminars, but also hopefully think about how we can use an interdisciplinary engagement, drawing from history, drawing from a number of disciplines, to try to think about what are the conditions of what led us to this point. What are the conditions, historical conditions, the broad spectrum, economic, political, cultural, that lead to current public health responses appearing as natural or inevitable? And I want to argue here that Zika reveals these trends, reveals a number of trends in Brazilian society, and it reveals the same trends that, you know, for those of you who were watching the news last night, the same trends that explain what happened in the case of the response to Zika are in a way connected with the broader political predicaments that the country is facing right now. For those of you who don't know, the country is facing, at the moment, a huge crisis is in its democratic model. I won't go into that detail, but I, would, but I think for me, there's an interesting parallels to be drawn there. Okay. So I want to argue then that we, when we look at Zika, Zika as a, as a kind of an analyzer, as Gustavo was saying uh, earlier this morning, as a kind of a, a mirror that shows the extent to which health is political, the extent to which health functions as a kind of a mirror of politics. And Zika functions and functions in the past few years as a mirror of Brazilian politics, but also, I want to argue, as a mirror of broader issues in global health, global health politics. Okay? So, what are these trends? I want to talk about six, if you bear with me. I'm going to be brief, but there are six broad trends that I, I think are quite relevant for thinking about how we caught to this point and what explains the narrowness and the limitations of this public health response. First trend I want to talk about, depoliticization. What do I mean with this? Depoliticization, namely, of governance and of public policy. The casting, the framing of public health responses as technical, apolitical, objective responses to predefined or self-evident problems, right? The claim that when we're talking about health, these are merely technical problems that need to be solved, right? Technical, scientific problems, scientific being understood in a kind of a narrow sense of kind of uh, uh, um, natural sciences. And what I think this is problematic because it obscures the deep political character, the political nature of public, pol public health policies. They are dependent upon political choices about who we are, what kind of society we want to be. These are political choices, these are political options, these are political forms of action and inaction. And these explain what range of choices our political imagination what range of choices in terms of public health policies are seen as possible and desirable? So what we, what, what we see very often in, in, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this movement of depoliticization is a kind of a whitewashing of ideology. Because, make no mistake, the attempt to depoliticize is in itself a political move, right? It's an attempt to disguise or to obscure what is in fact a very marked political project, 
very often connected with attempts to um, discredit public health responses. So what we have here is an attempt to kind of to, to throw a veil over politics, to argue that this is all about technical choices. Here in Britain, we faced in uh, or faced for the past few years with austerity politics, right? And this idea that there is no alternative, that there is a technical solution to a problem. There is no way. It's not about political choice. It's not about ideology, right? It's about a technical fix to a concrete problem that is self-evident, right? And what I want to argue is that a similar process has happened in the case of uh, a public health response, and certainly in the case of Zika. The idea that it is not about political choices, about what, who we want to be as a society. So that's, for example, if we think about the Brazilian health system, the SUS, the, 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 the universal health system in Brazil, SUS was a moment of politics in Brazilian society. It was a moment in which a society got together, it was in 1988 in the Brazilian constitution, the country got together and made a choice about what kind of society it wished to be. And this was enshrined in the constitution in which Brazil said, we want to have a universal health system that is free, that is uh, uh, with equal access to all, that is decentralized, etc., etc. It's uh, adjusted to local uh, 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 needs and local, uh, local problems. And this was a political, a deeply political moment. But since then, what we've witnessed is that there, are, uh, there is a constant depoliticization of SUS. SUS is, uh, or a lot of people would want SUS to become just a merely technical or series of technical fixes to technical or objective or self-evident problems. And Zika marked, I think, another example of this attempt to depoliticize, to obscure the political origins of the Brazilian health system. So that's trend number one. Trend number two, a context, a broader context of political retrenchment, what I call political retrenchment. And this, of course, is connected with a number of dynamics that we observe in the world, the rise of conservatism, social conservatism, the rise of a pol uh, political polarization, a retreat of solidarity that we observe in the case, we've observed in the case of the United States, for example, the retrenchment of the United States into its own kind of a self-inward movement uh, uh, in its politics that we've arguably observed in the case of Britain as well with the Brexit vote has been an example, the rise of far-right parties everywhere in Europe, and as we're sadly witnessing as well in the case of Brazil with also the rise of, uh, of an authoritarian movement that uh, is very close to going into power. So we got a situation of political retrenchment, a situation of, uh, of political polarization, which revealed itself in the case of Zika by a dynamic that are trends to blame the victims. So the public health uh, 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 response on the part of the government was very much focused on mosquito control and vector control, and its emphasis was on attempts to change the behavior, individual behavior, without taking into account the conditions in which individual choice occurs, as if individual choice would happen in a vacuum, in a social economic vacuum. So what you observed here was that it was an attempt to change individual behaviors, for example, take care of your own garden so that you don't have mosquito breeding sites. This, of course, forgot the fact that in a large percentage of Brazilian households, families need to rely on makeshift compartments in order to store water. They cannot afford not to have these compartments. In a lot of neighborhoods in Brazil, in the Brazilian comunidades of the so-called favelas, there are, there is no running water. There is no adequate sanitation infrastructure. So what kind of choice can people have here in terms of changing their behavior so as to prevent the spread of mosquitoes? So again, this turned into an attempt to blame victims, what were in fact victims. So this is, I think, part of the political context of retrenchment, of polarization, and also it's, uh, it's interesting to see that in Brazil there was a lot of regional discrepancies, right? With a lot of finger pointing at the poorest states, for example, in the northeastern regions of Brazil that were stigmatized because the highest incidence of Zika was in these northeastern regions. These are also the poorest. These have been 
systematically placed in positions of disadvantage, but also systematically stigmatized. So there's a number of, uh, of, of dynamics here connected with, or, with, the, with the rise of a less solidarity or a retreat of solidarity at domestic level that also reveals itself at the global level. Third dynamic I'd like to speak about today, and it's six only, okay, so we're halfway, bear with me. The third, neoliberal economics. Okay, so namely a context of deregulation, privatization, structural adjustment policies leading to austerity, leading to the pullback of public services, to the underfunding of public, of defunding of public services, a retreat of the state in general as a public service provider, the idea that the state is shedding its responsibilities or changing its responsibilities or reconfiguring its role in its relation with private actors. And the idea that state functions as a kind of a clearinghouse for business, for other private actors. There's a huge debate in Brazil right now, and there's a huge, the, the Brazilian health system, the public health system is in crisis, is under threat because of the rise of public health providers. And it's actually being, I would say, I don't know if my Brazilian friends would agree with me, but I would say that there is actively an attempt to dismantle and to discredit the public health system with a certain agenda in mind, a certain business-oriented agenda in mind. Okay? So this is, a, this is a context in which, in which uh, I think the Brazilian, uh, the Brazilian and Latin American response to Zika had to play out, the obstacles that uh, institutions like Fiocruz had to face. And how did it reveal itself? For example, in my field work, I've observed the difficulties in the implementation of of responses to Zika in, in, in the form of, for example, the precarization of health workers. If you have precarious health workers, workers who have no job security, who have no working conditions, who don't have the materials to do their job, who don't have the adequate information, who, you know, who are themselves vulnerable because they are with, with a meager pay and low uh, uh, job security and low occupational health conditions, then you're going to have an inefficient response. And certainly, precarization, and I do work uh, with community health workers in, 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 in Brazil. I, I studied them for a number of years. And certainly, precarization is one of the huge challenges to their work and to the effectiveness of their work. And this connects with the precarization, with the dynamics of the precarization of labor and the feminization of labor. They are, uh, they are one of the hallmarks of neoliberalism. And of course, I think there's the project of dismantling of the national health system that I think is very much connected with this neoliberal agenda. Fourth dynamic. So I've covered, just to sum up, I've covered uh, depoliticization, a context of political retrenchment. I've, con I've, I've covered neoliberal economics, and I would like to focus on one that's also equally important, which is patriarchy which is very important when we're talking about, about Zika, as you know, because it's a highly gendered health issue. It's an outbreak that, if, that places women in a particular position of vulnerability because of the conditions or the problems regarding pregnancy. And, of course, we all know that there are a number of difficulties surrounding the uh, sexual and reproductive rights in a lot of countries in Latin America, particularly in Brazil. But I think there's also other deep, deep issues that, through which patriarchy reveals itself in the case of Zika. The idea that women's bodies are a thing to be ruled over. Is, this is something that kind of was very much present in the declarations of some high political response, uh, uh, people who are in, uh, in uh, positions of power in Brazil that were kind of just for whom the, the public health response to the, the, the issue of Zika was just to tell women to avoid getting pregnant or tell women to cover their bodies so that they don't, didn't get stung by mosquitoes. So the idea that women's bodies is something that is something to be ruled over is very much present and it was reproduced in the public governmental discourse. As I mentioned, the, the neglect of sexual and reproductive rights, again, places in, in, in question the, the issue of choice, you know. If you're going to say someone don't get pregnant 
avoid pregnancy. It's very hard to condition choice in this context when, for example, a lot of women in Brazil are not able to negotiate the use of contraception with their partners. A lot of women do not have access to the best available information about how to avoid a pregnancy. The, the, the very availability of contraception is problematic in some areas. So all of these condition choice, and all of these I'd like the problem of the absence or the neglect of sexual reproductive rights. The absence of maternal and child health. And our uh, uh, representatives from the social movements who are here present, they can tell you exactly the limitations of the public health system in terms of its, its uh, neglect or almost total neglect of support systems and support mechanisms for families affected by Zika congenital syndrome. The reduction of women to the role of mothers, it's also another issue, you know. For Zika, in the case of Zika, women were not seen as women, they were seen as mothers, they were seen as risks, public health risks, in as much as they were or could potentially give birth to children with Zika congenital syndrome. And this, of course, reproduces a, an idea of women's health, which is kind of very much focused on the maternal side, as if women were just mothers, not, nothing more. Concomitantly, at the same time, you have an, a, a reproduction in Zika policy, a reproduction of the idea of women as carers, as natural born carers, who don't need to be <coughs> rewarded for their work as carers because that's just their nature, that's what they do. And certainly in my own work with community health workers, the overwhelming majority of which are women, there's this sense that these women, while they're doing the job that they're doing for their communities and for their families, well, it's just part of their nature. They're women, women are caring, that's what they do. And this reproduces the kind of a, a, a double burden or triple burden of women, in the sense that they need to care for their own Selves. They need to care for their families. They need to, in the case of community health workers, they need to care for their neighborhoods, the patients and the in, in the communities they serve. So the, and this is all seen as something that they need, they, they, they give, that they provide freely out of their own good, caring nature as women. And this, of course, helps to reproduce the precarization of their, of their working conditions and their living conditions. So I think Zika is a crisis of patriarchy. It's a crisis of misogyny as well, in a way that women were seen as these bodies to be ruled over, as women, as mothers to be controlled or to be, uh, to, to, to be governed. So that's dynamics number four. Very quickly to the fifth one, colonialism. Very important to think about the persistence of colonial or neo-colonial, or whatever you want to call it, dynamics in global health. In a way, the, 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 the way in which the Zika outbreak was framed as a crisis, or it was, uh, the response was very much focused on crisis management and containment, which is very much, um, uh, kind of stems back and brings us back to some of the traditions of tropical medicine. The idea that we need to contain certain diseases at the source, source meaning normally countries in the south, before they reach western shores. And certainly this made me think again about the Ebola outbreak also. Do you remember the Ebola? Ebola was suddenly, Ebola was, everyone was silent about Ebola, but then suddenly everyone became, became very worried and very alarmed about Ebola. Why? Because suddenly Americans, Spaniards started becoming infected. People were traveling. Health workers were white, European, American, or from the north. And this, of course, is redolent of the, 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 the traditions of tropical medicine, of colonial medicine. The idea that it is important to contain these diseases in those regions where they originate before they reach our shores. And certainly this was present, I think, in, 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 uh, in, in Brazil's society, which is a highly div divided society, highly unequal society, as you all know, when there was a process of, or a similar process of a, kind of an attempt to, 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 to contain the disease or to racialize the disease, to ascribe the disease to a certain region of the world, to a certain region of the country, namely the northeastern states, where, which were identified 
with, uh, uh, with poorest populations, with a highly percentage of black uh, communities. And there was a, surely an attempt to, or this was connected in my view, with the victim blaming, with finger pointing, with the idea that these are the kinds of things that happen in poor regions or poor sections of our cities as a result of certain um, undesirable habits or undesirable uh, um, living conditions or just the way that, that people live in those, in those regions. And of course, the Northeast in Brazil, and of course my Brazilian friends will be able to tell you a lot more about this, has historically been connected, historically been stigmatized because it is traditionally poorest, so it's, well, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's areas where there's a high per, uh, um, percentage of black people, and there's always this, a, a number of stigmas uh, connected to it. And it's always seen as, an, as a place that is mired in tragedy, a place you know, where these things just, just happen. All of these things, just, they just occur. There's nothing that can be done about it. It's a bit like the world or the, the, the global health uh, authorities in the north reacted to the Ebola outbreak. The idea that you know, what was happening in West Africa is just the same old story of African wretchedness. There's nothing that can be done about this except containing, of course, except preventing these problems from reaching our shores. So there were, this is a very colonial type of mentality. The idea that these people are helpless, there's nothing that can be done about them. We can try to contain, we can try to prevent, we can try to send out some people to support and prevent them from, 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 from the situation from getting much worse, but inevitably this will continue to occur. And certainly I think, again correct me if I'm wrong, I think there was a similar rationale happening in the case of Brazil in relation to the northeastern states. Again, no, states where it is the common idea is that you know, these things just happen because that's the northeast, that's the poor area of the country, there's nothing that can be done about it. Okay, and also we talk about colonialism, it's important, and, and I'm, I'm reminded here again by the presence of our, of our friends from the social movements, the fact that research into Zika was highly colonialist. Okay? And again, the, the friends here can, can tell you about their own experience with researchers. Suddenly Brazil was invaded by thousands of researchers, a lot from the global north, a lot from other regions of the world, who parachuted in, collected their samples, and left without giving sufficient return of their results without giving something back to the communities from which they extracted in a predatory way their data, sometimes even the living samples out of babies and, 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 and mothers, without returning, without giving something back, without even having the trouble to report back on what they found. And of course, a lot of researchers made their careers out of this and advanced, and I can understand the anger that a lot of these social movements feel because of this, because they were exploited in a very colonial way. The last dynamic that I'd like to speak about today, and sorry for taking too long, the spectacle. The idea that global health problems today easily turn into media spectacles. We saw this with Ebola. A lot of furore, a lot of noise, followed by silence and boredom. Global health issues, or in global health, diseases very much, very often become hostage to the media cycle. A short-termist, myopic media cycle, in which, which constantly needs to be fed with new information, with new developments, so as to keep up the excitement. In the era of 24-7 news, in the era of infotainment, we need, we, public, the global civil society, we need diseases, <laughs> as ready-made products that we can consume. We can get slightly titillated, but it's a, it's a spectacle that we observe, we in the North. Because, let's face it, we Northern, from, from the North, we are not in the front line, more often than not. We're not in the front line. So what we get here is that health problems get trapped in this media, short-termist, superficial attention, Noise followed by boredom. 
And of course, this is accompanied by the spectacularization of suffering. We saw this in the case of Ebola. We saw this very clearly in the case of Zika as well, namely with the children with microcephaly, in which the use of images, of course, it was used and it was important to show what was happening, to elicit a response, a swift response on the part of the health system. But at the same time, it became a spectacle. And again, I can understand why a lot of the, the people were affected by these conditions. They felt that they were used. Their images were being used for the advancement of other agendas, and agendas that not always coincided with what they wanted or what they needed. So we got the coverage of Zika in the Western media, but also in Brazilian media, fed this spectacle, fed itself from this spectacle, and actually reproduced to the neglect of this. Because everyone was talking about Zika a couple of years ago. Right now, who is talking about Zika? Very few people are still talking about Zika. There's not enough attention being paid to Zika. But the problems are still there. The global health crisis of epidemic proportions is still there. The, the emergency is not over, as uh, Gustavo was saying this in the morning. It's not over. Even though the WHO says it's not a public health emergency of international concern, the Brazilian government has also uh, um, not uh, declared the, the, the end of the emergency, but the emergency, the everyday emergencies persist. And we have the living proof in this room, and the, 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 the social movements and the mothers who are faced with these situations, who have to deal with the realities, with the everyday realities of Zika and its repercussions. Okay, so just to wrap up, I argued here that there is a toxic combination of depoliticization, of political entrenchment, of neoliberal economics, of patriarchy, of colonialism and racism, and of the spectacle that has led to the situation that we're faced with. It tells us a lot about the Zika response, I think. It tells us a lot about Brazilian society, I think, as well. It tells us a lot about global health how global health priorities are defined, how the global health agenda is defined. So it tells us about, I think, a lot of dynamics, important dynamics about world politics. I'm happy to answer any questions in more detail about each of these, but I think it's important that we talk about them. It's important that we recognize them. At a time when democracy is at stake, and at a time when, in many countries, not just in Brazil, but in Brazil, in many other countries, and at a time when we increasingly recognize that protecting health or speaking up for health and fighting for better health is connected, intrinsically connected with fighting for democracy as well. So I think we are faced with unprecedented challenges at the moment in Brazil, but in the world as well, which connect with health, but also connect with democracy. The two are connected, and I wanted to show here today that indeed the dynamics, the broader political and economic dynamics that are impacting upon democracy are also impacting decisively upon the public health response. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Sanjoy, especially to be here in the Global Health History Seminar. So it's an honor to, to be here and to discuss with you. It's, uh, well, I have to be honest with you because um, my mind and my thinking is here, but my heart is in my country in this moment. Well, we have um, a very uh, democratic threat in our country in this moment. So uh, in the first round of our election, uh, the radical right wing uh, was elected and goes to the second round in our election. So it's not to talk just about um, uh, right and left wing. It's to talk about democracy, to talk about the MNS, uh, to come back to military regime, to the old times in the Latin American. So this is very old fashioned way to talk about our country. But uh, this is the truth. So we um, count with your solidarity and the international uh, institutions uh, to go with us against uh, authoritarian regime in our country. 
Yes, so uh, thank you. But uh, I have to, to say it first. Uh, last night I can't, I couldn't sleep. Yes, with uh, the news about our elections. But we have opportunity to change the game. So uh, three uh, weeks from now, we will have the second round. So let's do it, uh, good work. So, uh, and uh, it's, it's opportunity to talk about our Zika experience and to have our social, social movements here. And thank you, João. João uh, helped me a lot uh, in details of some uh, political wishes in our country in, to face the Zika epidemic. Uh, in a political and economic context, it's uh, important to, to say to you that during the Zika outbreak, we had two presidents and five ministers of health. Yes, in the middle of the political crisis in our country. And our elected president was impeached. Yes, so you know about this. So uh, democratic and scientific institution, as few crews um, had an important role to face a Zika outbreak in that moment, because we are the key actors uh, to uh, respond to the uh, Zika outbreak and uncertainties. It's not about a uh, um, disease that we already know about this uh, etiology and repercussion, so it was completely new. What we knew about Zika in that moment, it, it was a uh, light dengue or something. The, the first minister of health that mentioned about Zika infection in Brazil, it's don't be afraid about it, don't worry about Zika, we have to pay attention on dengue because dengue kills. Right, it's good, it's important, but uh, what we saw in that moment, it's an incredible thing. Yes, many physicians, many pedi pediatricians, uh, people who have uh, experience on infection disease, never saw uh, such a syndrome like that, yes, in that moment. So uh, it's not about just health emergency, it's about uncertainties. And it's important to say that Brazil, the characteristic of Brazil, it's not the same of the African countries, as you know. Our key the key, uh, important key to understand Brazil is to call iniquity. This is the important key to, to understand the Brazilian contest. We have important and very good scientific institutions. We have a very strong, uh, until now, <laughs> uh, national health system, yes, and very uh, progressive laws in our country to protect the society. But while well, iniquity is very strong, it's very hard. And this is an historic um, um, trajectory of our country history. So uh, what we would like to share with you is some histories about Zika and how we are uh, analyze the Zika as a big analyzer, as uh, João mentioned, as we would like to, to focus on. Uh, it is works? Yes? Yes? So, better. Mm. No? No. Not no, no, it's okay, it's okay, it's all fine. No, 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 it's okay. No, thank you. Uh, so, this presentation will focus on Zika epidemic effects during and after uh, the outbreak in Brazil during 2015 and 2018. Uh, well, I usually mention uh, the global emergency about Zika is over. But Zika is not over for us. It's not over, not over for the families. It's not over for the repercussions of the neurodevelopment uh, clinical uh, assistance for them. Most of them are not uh, assisted by the public health system. 
Just to give you an example, an important example. So during the 2015 until 2018, we had 15,000 notifications about microcephaly. About microcephaly, you already know that Zika congenitor syndrome, it's not necessary to have microcephaly. 30% of the case doesn't have uh, microcephaly. So, but just the microcephaly cases during this period, we have 15,000 of notifications. And just 3,000 of cases were confirmed by Zika infection. And the other 12,000, what's happening in this country? We have to talk about uh, uh, what is the causes of uh, microcephaly, congenitive syndromes as syphilis, toxoplasmosis, citolomegaly virus. We don't have adequate uh, health surveillance to identify this. So this is going invisible, and the government just focus on Zika uh, microcephaly. Uh, syndr uh, congenital syndrome, right? Just, just to give you an example. And, uh, well, well, for us, it's, well, I am at home, so we have social scientists, historians here, so I cannot need to explain uh, what we can uh, understand, social policies and uh, infectious disease. So, what we would like to share with you is we are using a concept of enema himal from social from science studies enactment. We have many Zikas, Zikas in the society, Zikas in the science, Zika in the uh, policy, uh, health policies, so in the, also in the social movements. So that's easier put this uh, diagram here. Our intention is, is to uh, intersect Zika uh, among science, civil society, and health policies. So, just to take a specific point in the science dimension, it, uh, well, uh, it was a big challenge to inter interdisciplinary response, and it, uh, it was very fast in our country. If you cruise, was responsible for most of initiative uh, to study Zika. And uh, in, during 10 months, we identify the connection between Zika uh, infection and microcephaly or Zika congenital syndrome. So virology, entomology, clinical studies, especially uh, Zika congenital syndromes, diagnosis, and visualization and vestness. Visualization was very important. China has a monument <laughs> that uh, represents the Zika, Zika virus, visualizing it. The two big pictures during the Zika outbreak was the microcephaly babies and the others mosquito, just like this. Yes, can you remember that? When you think on Zika, it's just these two big pictures. Yes, uh, we, babies with small head and mosquitoes. The second relation is about health policies. Uh, João has mentioned about it, vector control, a national plan to combat microcephaly. And social movement is so important about it. It's how to turn visible children with disabilities. Yes, uh, the mothers, the women that fight to guarantee health system to the children, identify a solidarity. So, Children with microcephaly were completely invisible in our country. So we have a important policies to a person who has disability in our country, but without financing, without a, a network assistance. So uh, society was very important in that moment. It's not just about Zika. It's about all of us. Yeah. And in Brazil, they're organizing 
uh, health emergency central operations that uh, end in the end of the health, national health emergency. So, and to society, we can uh, share it uh, with the, the mothers here. The mother's expectation versus uh, realities. In every pregnancy, when you will have a baby, you have an imaginary about what uh, will be the baby, yes? When you don't know nothing what we will face in the future. Well, my baby will walk, I don't know. My baby will can see, we don't know. My baby will can talk, speak, we don't know. Nothing, because this disease are, were completely new. And some scientists and uh, neurologists uh, didn't mention uh, that uh, uh, the baby can live after the born, for example, with the severe microcephaly, for sure. So it's not just about the expectations. It's about uncertainties. It's about uncertainties about the future. And right now, she is living these uncertainties. And how can we stimulate it, this child, this student? So fear of the future, for sure. Women's reproductive health. You know that abortion is illegal in our country, in Brazil. So sexual and reproductive rights, it's a big issue in Brazil. So in the very beginning of the outbreak, uh, some women movements uh, saw opportunity to take back the abortion discussion in our country but it disappears after the second wave of the epidemic. And we have also have to study it. One data is important. The born rates decrease during the 2016. And why? Women postpone the pregnancy or they did abortion illegal in our country. And this is a very public health problem. So we also have to study it. And I, we also to explore the connections, the intersects between the dimensions. Intercept, in ethical concerns about research producers. As Joao already mentioned about it, just uh, to show a uh, short example and very critical one. M some mothers receive researchers from abroad, scientists from abroad, that offer to them uh, informed consent in English, in, in Mandarin. Can you believe in it? How to, to make it more ethical during uh, health emergencies? This is not so important. So uncertainty about the future, again, the relationship between scientists and families. Personal and institutional links between researchers and users. Well, the, the most affective with them. They uh, identify uh, their fears, their pains with the families. It's also very important, and sometimes uh, they break in the rules, <laughs> yes, to assist the families and their needs. Uh, emotional entanglements and social and economic environment rumors. So, about the rumors, um, in the beginning of Zika, we heard that we had uh, three theories about the etiology of microcephaly. One of them was about uh, vaccination of uh, yellow fever and the relation between Zika and vaccination about virus. It was a rumor. And also about uh, agrotoxic, the use of agrotoxic in the northwest of the country. Yeah. So, uh, and many other rumors. And 
you can imagine about uh, conspiracy theory about the Americans in the United States and in the country to attack the poor families and everyone. So, and uh, the relation between society and health policies. The focus on disabled children, as I mentioned before, this was very important. Uh, comprehensive healthcare access, we really did it, but not for all. And I've, I mentioned it before, the 3,000 children infected by Zika with microcephaly, just 33% is under stimulation. Just 33% all over the country. And just 60% has uh, access, access to specialized services as neurologists, physiotherapists, and others. So many of them are excluded, but just the microcephaly cases. And the other 30% that no, does no have uh, microcephaly. And uh, focus on control initiatives. And individual responsible for disseminated the mosquitoes to release mosquitoes all around the country. Yes, and you are responsible for it, not the public, not the collective. And there's going invisible sanitation conditions, uh, living conditions, clean water, many questions about territory and environment completely disappear in the policies discussion and the related with uh, relation between governments, authorities, and society was very authoritative, right? As in the same in the beginning of 20th century. That's it's a kind of pattern that we deal with epidemics in our country. I know that just in Brazil, I know that in many countries. So, and the last one, rapid response coordination, low visibility about sexual transmission. Brazil was the only country that doesn't, uh, didn't adopt the sexual transmission of possibly possibility to transmit Zika infection during the pregnancy. And regulation and financing, this is another problem. We receive a lot of international funding to study Zika in our country. And it was compulsory to share data. And it's very, very difficult to do with it. Yes, even in the US and the other institutions, so how to to deal with the regulations about this. We have to, so uh, just, just to mention, it's important to share data, but how? How uh, we can have a follow-up, we can have authorship, we can have a sustainable de scientific uh, development in our country to sustainable science and health assisting. So uh, it's, it's very complicated. Uh, discussion. And uh, in the importance of uh, primary health care, and uh, João already mentioned about it, and about prenatal diagnosis. We expand our primary health care system, but we have to talk, we have to go deeper uh, in the quality of prenatal uh, health care to identify early diagnosis, early abnormalities during pregnancy, but how people can have access to diagnosis. This is another big problem in a big country as Brazil. So, recommendations. Brazil was the country most affected by Zika and its consequences. But last summer in our country, Zika, Dengue, and Chikungunya disappeared completely. We just focus on yellow fever vaccination because we had an epidemic of yellow fever, an outbreak of yellow fever in our country. Brazilian science played an essential role in improving Zika research. International funding in cooperation should be oriented towards reinforcement of scientific development in low and middle income countries through a mutual learning process. 
improvement and listening to social movements and response to societal needs through a participation in science and policy making. Promotion of innovation through interdisciplinary and intersectorial approach in order to minimize social inequities to access to health care and living conditions. Strengthening of the reactions of national and international scientific communities to threats of new outbreaks of Zika and other arboviroses. Such a strengthening is especially important in the context of decreasing investment in science and technology and reduction of social protective policies in Brazil. It should be grounded in the defense of the height for the height to health for all again. We had in July an um, important workshop about lessons learned, recommendation, and preparedness. We are in finishing the document and we will share it very soon. And then in input in the same room, biomedical scientists, social science, policy makers, and social movements. It, not, it was not easy, this discussion, but we can build important recommendations to authorities, to international community for funding to research and to health access and to social protection. So our proposal and invitation, Sanjoy and our group, yes, we intended to extend this investigation to other national histories from countries affected by Zika infection and its repercussion to build a critical global health history about the Zika epidemic in 2010. Zika Global Health History Initiative. I think that is so important in a many cross-dimension issues as sexual and reproductive rights, about dis disability, about social movements and democracy and participation, about how national health systems are responding to Zika epidemic and its repercussions. So that's it. I have to, to run to have some time to, to talk and discuss with you all. Thank you very much. I mean, thank you for three wonderful talks. I mean, I have to very quickly add that for those who do not know, uh, Fiocruz is actually an arm of the Federal Health Ministry of Brazil. And the fact that we can have two colleagues uh, from the Federal Health Ministry of Brazil stand and be critical about their own role, for me, is democracy. Uh, and long may that survive because, uh, and if it doesn't survive, people outside Brazil will have to fight for it to survive in other ways. So that's my two pence on uh, my, my respect and admiration for many years for what Fiocruz stands for. And not just because they're my friends, I mean, you know. <laughs> um, so I would like to invite uh, questions and answers and would you like to join us here? Uh, clarifications, comments, debate, you know. Again, democracy means disagreeing on matters. So if you have questions uh, comment, uh, to ask, comments to make, please go ahead. I am going to exercise <laughs> while taking the mic around to you. Uh, I can find it. Oh, you okay, <laughs> sir. Uh, you've already done so much. Do you want me to run around? God, Mr. Uh, Prince. Right. Right. Mm. Yeah. 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 Questions, comments? That's yes. <laughs> Um, you said that you think that Ebola is still a neglected disease. Do you think that Zika is still a neglected disease? Shall I answer it? Yeah. Well, um, I think a lot of the things that I've said today would, in my view, make it well, qualify it as a neglected disease. I think when we're talking about neglect in global health, I think it's important that we don't confine ourselves to specific diseases. I think we need to have a, 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 a broader understanding of neglect in global health. I think we need to consider not just diseases specifically as being neglected, but actually understand the relational dimensions of neglect and talking about specific groups as being neglected yes. or being prevented from accessing the best quality 
healthcare or the prevention mechanisms in a given situation. So you don't really have, in my view, you don't really have neglected diseases per se. You have neglected diseases as they are experienced by certain groups in particular circumstances. So um, Ebola would, in my view, qualify as a neglected disease in the sense that, on the one hand, we don't yet have, in terms of the global response, a, a sufficient uh, uh, a sufficient set of policies that would prevent the outbreaks from occurring and the proof is that we've recently also have a, a more recent outbreak of Ebola in, in, in the African continent as well. In the case of Zika, I think what you witness is that you have the persistence of a number of groups that have been prevented from accessing the best quality healthcare, the best quality support uh, network and this, yes, would qualify it as a neglected issue. I wouldn't say it is a neglected disease. It's a neglected issue in the sense that you observe layers, dimensions of neglect in this case. Zika as it is, or and its repercussions, importantly, when we talk about Zika, we talk about also the Zika congenital syndrome, that which stems from Zika. And its repercussions are part of a broad landscape of neglect, which has different dimensions. So yes, I think when we talk about Zika, it's important that we focus on the, the, these different dimensions of neglect that surround Zika. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I just, I'm not, I'm not going to ask a question. I just want to give my observation about this. One thing I discovered, it's like human beings, we are selfish. <laughs> You've said it. <laughs> Because I'm from the media, I worked in the media also in the academic community as well. Um, what I just want to point out, the Ebola issue started in 1976 in DR Congo, and that's where they got even the name. But a lot of us didn't even know, we didn't care. Somebody in West Africa then will feel, what's my business with Zaire, yeah. now DR Congo? See what happened? I would ravage the whole of West Africa. It's back in Congo again after 42 years. The same thing with Zika. One thing I discovered about human beings, we need to change our perspective about life. It's not just about Zika. I'm here, I'm, I'm of Nigerian origin. I heard about this on the BBC documentary. I got in touch with the people involved. The same thing with autism in Ethiopia. The same thing with prison reforms around Africa. But I asked myself this question. Why is it that we are so selfish? Even when I'm working on homophobia, I'm not gay, but sincerely, I fight for their right. But people, even people who are involved are asking me, are you sure you're still not in the closet? People who have, people, yeah, people yeah. who have Ebola, people who have Zika, they still don't believe that, yeah, even when I'm doing my prison reform, people are like, are you sure you don't have people in the prison? That's the way we are brought up. That's the way we are as human beings. We need to change that. Even the government, I'm surprised. The last president was a woman in, in Brazil. They asked her the same question on Christiana Amampo. She could not really give an answer. So we are all guilty. I'm sorry for, for what happened to these mothers. Mm. Every time we're talking about Zika, 90% women. The documentary on BBC is still on their broadcast. All you hear is, Germana and other people. Only one man that I heard his voice. It's so, it's so sad. We just like push, and all, the, all these people, these women did not have these children on their own. A man put the seed inside, then they run away. Mm. So the, it, it goes beyond blaming governments. It, it goes beyond blaming us in the media. We have to blame ourselves. Because ask yourself, if you didn't have a disabled child, I'm sorry to say this, even some of us who are fighting for Zika and whatever, for some of us, it's because we are directly involved. Ask ourselves, mm -hmm. what if, yeah, I had healthy children, everything went fine? Would we be here? Mm -hmm. But I tell people, before we can fight any problem in the world, just take yourself away from that problem. You don't mm -hmm. have to have that problem before you start fighting. Mm -hmm. I, don't have no, I don't have any problems, I don't have um, any personal issue with Ebola, with Zika, with prison reforms, but I'm deeply into all these things. We all have to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. we, we have to stop being selfish. Mm -hmm. At times I want to cry about the war. I was asking Jemana, I wish we could trust each other. I wish this world could be a place where there is 
there is problem in Yemen. Every day I talk about Yemen. Every day I talk about Syria. I don't know anybody there, but I fight the system entrenching yes. all these things. We are all selfish. I'm sorry to say this. <laughs> yes, but I, I, I'd like to respectfully disagree with you. I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we are naturally selfish. I think there are certain conditions. I don't. I, I, this this is going to go into a, a deep philosophical discussion about human nature, and I don't want it to go into that. But I would like to point out is that I think there are conditions in our current political, economic, and cultural context that uh, facilitate uh, inwardness, facilitate solipsism, and certainly the the the, the media is uh, partly to blame. For this, uh, for for its uh, arguably a solipsistic coverage, but it's not just the media. Its uh, researchers are also partly to blame in their approach to research. Many researchers, are, as I've pointed out, its politicians who work who are working to in the short term electoral cycle who are also to blame. Its uh, uh, business interests who put the the, the the interests of profit before uh, communal well-being. So there's a number of problems here that facilitate inwardness, facilitate solipsism. If you look, for example, I mean, this is, you're a journalist, so you, this is close to your, to your heart. If you look at, for example, a lot of the coverage of the, 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 the Ebola outbreak, it was markedly solipsist. It was, a, it was a framing of Ebola as a problem of the West and its travails with West African populations as a background. As a, as a side effect, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an extra in this overarching narrative. I was looking at uh, some examples of the, of the Western coverage of the Zika crisis uh, in 2016. And I don't know if you're all familiar you are with, with British media. And there was a lot of noise on British media about the plight of couples who had holidays scheduled to go to Brazil in 2016 and couldn't have their dream destination or their dream honeymoon in Brazil or the Caribbean because of the Zika. And suddenly it was again a story about the West, a story about Western populations. So this, in my view, is a condition or facilitates solipsism facilitates this inward kind of looking. So it's not about engaging and empathizing with the plight of others, with the plight of other, of other, of other uh, uh, regions, less advantaged and more vulnerable than you. It's about, it's about yourself. And a lot of the Western media, it's, a, it's, it's, a con it's the West talking about itself. And this is part of what I, w I meant when I spoke about the spectacle. When you turn things into a spectacle, it becomes a spectator sport, right? And a spectator sport is something that you get mildly excited about, it's something that interests you for a while, then you get bored. It's not a matter of life or death for you. It's something that just you use to pass the time, most of the time. And, certain, and certainly in the case of, of, of Zika, this is what happened. There was a, sh a lot of noise. There was a lot of attention, but you need to ask yourself about the quality of attention. And when I speak of Ebola or Zika in response to the, to, to the other person in the audience there, well, as neglected diseases, you need to think about not just the quantity of attention that the initial receives, but what kind of attention, the quality of attention. It's not about the number of mentions on social media. It's not about the number of, 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 of minutes in primetime TV that is devoted to this issue. It's about what kind of things are being said, and importantly, what kind of things are not being said? What is neglected? What is being silenced? What is being forgotten? I think yes, yeah. I, I think that uh, uh, we have a very important point. Mm -hmm. I agree with jo Joao that uh, uh, selfish right. is not a natural yeah. condition. But you mentioned a very important sociological problem. Mm -hmm. do, uh, do you need the experience to have empathy and to fight for a common uh, common fight. Uh, so I think that uh, we have to think about this because the conditions for this kind of movement not based only in the identity but for cross sectorial <laughs> identities uh, for a more general perspective uh, depends on contexts and you have to think about why it's so difficult uh, today to have more uh, agreement and more uh, strongest uh, fights 
uh, union people uh, independent of the particular experience. Yeah. I think I think that many factors can explain this. João mentioned some of them. I think that you can think about this as an important problem for yeah. our contemporary society. Sorry to be pretty, uh, uh, but my, con my, con my concern is like, we are taking things just from academic view alone, and from the academic world as well. Because all these things we're talking about, even media framing, that's what I did my PhD thesis on. But it's not just fair, like, you like looking like, yeah, the researchers, the media will say the researchers, someone will say government, the government will say this. We all keep throwing the blames at each other. But sincerely, it goes beyond coming to conferences alone. These are people going through all these things. That's why I'm talking about selfishness, because I'm still seeing it. In this room, like, if, if we all try to cover it, like, yeah, we don't see it as selfishness. But I will tell you something. When I mentioned Zika on, on social media in the past uh, one week, everybody was like, oh, oh, that thing in Brazil. Oh, I thought it, it was finished. People in Africa will say that. But it's like, when something happens, Ebola happens, people in Brazil will say, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Like, it's like, let's look beyond. I'm not Brazilian. I'm not from, from, I'm from Africa. But look. I'm passionate. Yes, I don't care where you come from. I'm passionate about everybody's fight. And that's why up to today, people still think I used to be the closest when I'm fighting for who, who are against homophobia in this country or anywhere in the world. And that's why I'm trying to tell you, I make people, the way we think, it goes beyond the classroom <coughs> differently. Because even people who, who pay a lot of money on research, it's simply because their mother had cancer and died. And then all of a sudden, the multi-billionaire is bringing out money. If the daughter or the mother did not die of, of uh, cervical cancer, they wouldn't do anything. And that's what I'm talking about, selfishness. Because ask yourself, people like Bill Gates, the children do not have anything to do with HIV and malaria. But look at how much he's spending, even in Nigeria alone. My brother is involved. So there are so many things involved beyond blaming the media, blaming politicians. Let's, let's go back to our rooms and just think about it. Am I doing enough? I don't have Zika, but am I thinking that, oh yeah, it's just a Brazil problem. Or oh, Ebola is just whatever. But, but, but there is something that is not clear to me. So are you yeah. saying that if someone is going to give a lot of money, yeah. that automatically makes them, gives them the right uh, to then make decisions on everyone's behalf, or I know if you don't think very highly of classrooms and seminars like this, clearly from your comments, but aren't we challenging power more effectively than someone who seems to celebrate the billionaire who's giving money and you assume that he has no motives there? I'll say, I just say something because I, I What about the links between Microsoft and Gates Foundation? Yeah, but I'll say, I'll say this. I think you, you, you're not seeing what, where I'm coming from. No. What I said. No, no, I agree with yeah, you. What you I challenged said, us, I'm, I'm challenging you back. Yeah, I'm, keep, I'm, not, I'm not trying. I'm, this, is not, this is not a challenge. And I also I want to quickly point out something. Yeah. I think highly of the classroom. I have a PhD. I'm still from the university. I'm wearing a University but, of Leicester. So anything I say, I wouldn't want it to be like, a challenge, whatever. Because if we keep challenging no, each no, other, no, you're, you're we're not moving that forward. That people from the classroom do not go out. I have personally trained people who have gone and been on the front line of, of Ebola. So the classroom isn't completely useless. I didn't say the classroom was useless. I, I'm really disappointed that you're saying I'm a product of the classrooms. Yeah. They will agree. Education, a, higher I'm, education is not a complete I'm failure. A, it, 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 because I find it really, I find it ridiculous if you're saying this. Because I'm an academic doctor, I'm not a medical doctor. Right. So what I'm trying to say is like you know, you're not, you you're taking it from from another perspective. Bill Gates that I mentioned yeah. has not. What I'm saying is like a lot of people yeah. who donate to 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 research to science. Yeah. Mo majority of the people who do this is simply because they went through hell seeing their 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 their, their children having cancer. We have examples around the world. I'm telling you just one, mm -hmm. one billionaire mm -hmm. who didn't have to like have a child. I'm still taking it from the prison of selfishness. Please don't, don't like, I'm not talking, I'm not there's advocate. About, no, no, what yeah. I'm trying to point out here, yeah. there's about 20 years of scholarship yeah. that is critically 
looking at the role of philanthropy yeah. and the links with business. Be are you not aware of that? I'm aware of that. Then, yeah. then I think the debate can stop here because yeah. there are many facets yeah. to this. So, so let's not make heroes out of donors. <laughs> I never, made, I, I never, I never made, I never, I never made a hero out of, out of that's him. What I All I just, yeah, but that's what you're hearing. But what I'm trying to tell you is like, I'm giving an example. There are so many billionaires in the world funding research, but I've only made mention of somebody. Yeah, it might, it might benefit his business. But what I'm saying is like, at times it takes disaster in families. In, in all these multi-billionaires' family, before they remember something called prostate cancer, before they remember something called Zika. That's where I, I made it clear. I'm only giving that there is an exception, and that's what I'm trying to yeah, say. There's always variation, there are always exceptions. Exactly, study that's complexity. what I'm saying. So I don't come from... I, I think I don't all that's because of Yeah, because you're making it sound like I'm working with Mr. Gates. I don't have anything I mean, to do with him. I mean, if I were an evidence-based scholar and I had to footnote just that what you say about Gates' thing, <laughs> you know, so I work with evidence. If what you said is evidence. If I footnote that, there's a problem. Um, um, Cut off. I'm assuming there was someone else. Yeah. I do have a quick request for English speakers. Well, we have non-English speakers here, and myself and Denise were trying to translate simultaneously, which is a very hard job, especially because it's not our job. <laughs> We're not trained to do it. So if you could just speak a little slower, you'd be fantastic for us to um, translate. Uh, I do not have a, per a question, but I do have some comments on Juan's work, which uh, I think I've, we have some issue, things that we need to discuss, and I really like it. So thank you for your presentation. So uh, contain epidemic, contain women's bodies, and a threat that not only a nation, but as a sexual disease, could spread worldwide. So in a way, it's also about ruling black, poor women to maintain a certain sense of control and protection of a global north, if, uh, if I understood it right. And just one quick thing about the research methods that when you say they left, meaning that it would be people from outside the, my country, that being Brazil, that would do the horrible things that we read about it. Mm -hmm. The thing is, it was actually domestic. And uh, many researchers have been conducting um, not so very ethical or very good uh, practices. Uh, so thinking in terms of um, colonialism and as an ideology, but also as a very complex set of practices of doing science in everyday life of labs and healthcare facilities. And then I got to thinking, I've been thinking about, and I think it's interesting for a more profound research, as the epidemics, Zika epidemic, it's a known aspect, became more and more relevant and woke up the biomedical interest. I do think we seem to have been moving towards, or rather backwards, to Hila, the Henrietta Lex life and death, meaning the way she was subjected to, well, actually, the way she was subjected to research and what happens afterwards, I think everyone is familiar with it, and how she would left herself and the family without precise diagnostics or mm -hmm. not knowing what would happen with the body tissues. Mm -hmm. It is unfortunately very similar to what these people here and many others have been saying that foreign but also domestic scientists are still <coughs> doing. So just, you know, quick alert. And again, please, if you could speak slowly for us, it would be great. <laughs> um. So first of all, congratulations it's, to all. It's uh, re recording oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the online. So first of all, congratulations to all the three speakers. Brilliant. Uh, the first Zika cases in Brazil at least started to boom in the second semester of 2014. And as Nizia showed us, the, our health ministry declared the emergency in November 2015. So the first question is, did we fail? in identifying an emergency, a new disease affecting Brazil. The second question is, if so, what are the main challenges to deal with 
new diseases. I mean, John spoke a lot about the main issues, political, social, economic, uh, even technical, but uh, are we prepared to deal with new diseases? And telling us what are the main challenges. Was this a local problem or an inter a global trend to have difficulties in deal with new diseases, new challenges, special, especially infective diseases? All right. No. Uh, first of all, I think that Gustavo had mentioned that uh, in Brazil, in the beginning, the idea was that Zika was a light disease with no very severe implications. So I think that uh, when people uh, in Northeast identify, uh, they identify the relationship between first microcephaly and the Zika, so uh, many scientists uh, pay attention for the problem. One of them uh, at Fio Cruz, an infectologist, and so it, uh, there ha occurred a lot of meetings at health ministry just to convince the, the health ministry that it was a case of uh, uh, sanitary emergency. Uh, it was a process with negotiation, as all the process when science is involved in a situation as this, because the situation was new. Yeah. At that time, Brazil was in a pre-impeachment situation, but with a very unstable political contest. So it was not easy to the process of take decisions. Uh, that was one of, us, one of the aspects. Um, and in terms of the challenges, uh, I think that uh, we have to think in, in global uh, concern, as the invitation by Gustavo, mm -hmm. but you have to think of the local and national dimensions and uh, the social and economical implications in the atmosphere. Uh, so I think that uh, we have to think uh, about uh, a new health surveillance system involved in all the process, uh, biomedical, environmental, uh, uh, as a systematic program connected to global perspective, but in terms of the nation, the country, uh, is crucial to have the health system, uh, which was the main point of, of my presentation. The most important was not fuel crews, was the health system. Yeah? The fuel crews is a scientific institution for SUS. SUS is the nickname of a, yeah. a Brazilian public health, health system, system. Yeah. universal and with all the dimensions that Joan, jo, João mentioned in this speech. So I think that reinforced health system is uh, the most important part of uh, uh, how to deal with this challenge. And the health system uh, has the scientific uh, research inside it. Uh, and just to, to add some comments about your question and uh, Denise respond. No, I think that we not fail. We did it too fast. Yes, if you think scientifically. So in the, when we identified that Zika virus was circulating in the country, then we identify the relation between <coughs> Uh, Zika concerned syndrome and, and uh, Zika infection. Uh, if you think this is a new disease, nobody knows nothing about this. Yes. Nothing. No, no one can imagine that Zika can uh, result in a tragic, dramatic, and unexpected. Uh, congenital syndrome, and also Guillain-Barré syndrome, yes, as well, and 
you can question it. And Brazilian Institute did this, uh, the way to transmit Zika infection. We identified the virus in the semen. We identified the virus in the saliva. We identified the virus in the blood. So we can compare it and the Chagas uh, discovery about Chagas disease. And a completely different moment of biomedicine and technology for sure. But we fail to fight against social determination of health. We fail uh, when you cannot <coughs> face the uh, social environment and uh, economic inequities. We fail to face uh, the needs of the mothers and disability children all over the country. So uh, this is important to say. This is historically. Yes. So it's not just about the mosquito. It's not just about the vector control initiatives. It's just uh, to offer a better life to all Brazilian citizens. And also, it is a common point to many uh, developing countries. And just to add uh, a comment about your question, that's why we sometimes I think that we lead deal with the global health perspective when the south are exploded by the north in a global north and uh, they uh, <coughs> have opportunity to earn money for profit, for medicines, for biotechnology, development or something. Or we are victim. It's not about both. We have to rewrite global health perspective yes. in a more critical way. It's not just about the north, the global north and the global south. So we have to think globally and locally in a more democratic perspective, yes. in a more solidarity perspective. More fair. Yes, more fair perspective. So th that's why we need to talk this about sustainable ways to uh, sustainable cooperation in science, sustainable cooperation with international affairs and in other in others, uh, challenger fields. So I, I, I really think that we have to rethink with what we call global health. And uh, access yes. 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 <laughs> yeah, to... Like, I'm just like, I'm still thinking about my point and what I know he just uh, agreed with you. Yeah, 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 yeah well, which I really appreciate. Did you? Yeah, so and that's I what I'm saying. I also want to say I, I thank you all. I left all I had to do to come here. We started. I don't. I feel this is not good enough. This is good enough because you've given me the platform. You've given them the platform. Because the only thing is, that I'm just not happy the way you like. I'm not. I'm not being portrayed like somebody. I'm really passionate about everything you're doing. But I just know that it is beyond just thought. We need action. Yeah, we yeah. Also yes. Action. Yeah. We can comment more about it before uh, later. Yes, yes. Yes, 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 please. We have more questions. Yes, yes. 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 <coughs> suffer from Zika, but they were on the front line, so that's again evidence based rebuttal. But anyway. uh, you want to, so, final question, very quickly, because we are overrunning by 30 minutes, but final question. And. Uh, oh. Uh, Germana wants to, to make a question you, or a comment. I don't know. Yes. Now I share with Gustavo your um, concerns and words and um, about what comes what comes in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking in the question for you three is uh, from the global health historical perspective, what can be done to protect our national health system? If we have uh, our who uh, the Brazilian, Brazilian. Yeah, oh, yeah, Brazilian. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and if our um, the other countries experience that we could learn in all a colonized colonized way, but partially yeah. something that you have studied before, and we could learn as a Brazilians and uh, that we are facing this challenge very yes. soon. Yes, yes, I'll come back now. Um, so uh, I think that 
one of the reasons that we are here to try um, new ways to cooperate with the international uh, <coughs> academic institutes and in, in governments. So um, we need to, to build an international solidarity. The right to health, it's not just about uh, Brazil. It's about uh, everyone in this world, in this planet. So uh, this is what we need to, to share. It's a value. It's a not a technique. It's not a scientific evidence. It's a value that we have to share uh, among us. So uh, this is an important point. Um, in Brazil, we have to generate uh, evidence how uh, austerity uh, produce uh, illness, produce uh, inequality access uh, to health uh, system, to health care, and um, how to uh, take democracy in a large way. It's not just a representative democracy, <coughs> but in all the levels, in the community, in the health systems, and uh, policy making, and also in science. Mm -hmm. So uh, how to involve people since the beginning in the clinical, clinical trials, for example, in the clinical trials, to build together informed consent, to prepare people to receive uh, scientists in the field work, for example. So I think that there are many challenges, um, as Boaventura Souza Santos said, to reinvent democracy. Mm. So not just in Brazil, but all over the world. But we will have a special challenge in this very moment yes. to defend democracy, to defend human beings at all. Yeah. Just a point uh, I think that's important uh, for this moment. We are just now preparing a p position paper for the Asana conference. In this paper, our position is just especially to defend a broad conception of primary care and especially the defense of universal health systems and Brazilian health system. So the reper international repercussion of this position paper, I think that is uh, not uh, enough, but important uh, for us, just in this moment, as Gustavo mentioned. Universal public health system, not universal coverage. Yes, you know about it, but uh, here, this is not the same. Yes, when WHO defends uh, health universal coverage. Germana <laughs> asked me to translate, so uh, she has a question. Uh, she's agreeing with something and she'd like to make a statement. She's thanking uh, uh, being able to be here and uh, trusting in and in in um, enabling her presence here today. And she's very thankful to be here and to be speaking with you guys today. <coughs> in Brazil, everyone was caught by surprise from families to the uh, governmental authorities. And uh, in João's talk, she liked very much, and she agrees uh, how you um, put a light on the questions and the problems related to women's rights and women, the, the impacts in women's life. Women who they themselves forget to be, uh, who think of themselves as not only being mothers and uh, forget to be. 
woman. Yeah, yeah, woman. <laughs> but that happens with them themselves, and she liked how you portrayed that and the impacts of that. <laughs> they were blamed for uh, everything uh, from being pregnant, uh, like a like a castigo. Divine punishment. Uh, she's being punished for having a disabled child, and to not caring correctly for the family and the everything that, uh, and even for the child's <coughs> deficiency, she she's blamed for all of these aspects. Uh, But it's commonly overlooked how, uh, when these kids are born, how uh, it, it's looked upon as an opportunity and as a growth for these women and these families as well. And that's... Yeah, and she's saying how uh, this, the, these families and the, these women uh, have to make, make do with about $250. Per month, yes. Where uh, 76, approximately 76% of the women that are part of her movement, UMA, uh, the, the husbands and the partners have left, so they have to uh, make do with so little and no partners. And she's one of the statistics. Roughly 92% worked, were working mothers, and after having these children, had to stop working. And, and, and her, her and Vanessa are statistics in all of these aspects. So in this context, <coughs> the woman, women become the... Uh, uh, the responsible for the success of the child's quality of life or not. In a country where there's no social support for this. So besides being a mother and a care 24 hours a day, she has to be like a, a head of the family Physiotherapist, physiotherapist, for, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> a speech therapist, all sorts of uh, psychologists, uh, neuro, uh. and in Gustavo's talk, yeah, she'd, she'd like to um, emphasize the importance of diagnosis. In her association, UMA, they, they uh, represent uh, many cases where diagnosis is not uh, <coughs> given, and they, but even though they, the, the children are born and they have and they need social support. Yeah, so they, they organize a, a sort of list where they inform the government that cases where they, they weren't notified, so they're, they're actively organizing information and feeding it to the local uh, authorities. Essa questão do atendimento à criança, né? Tem um relatório do Ministério da Saúde de 2017 que fala que a cada seis crianças apenas uma teve um atendimento adequado e geralmente essa uma ela está na rede particular. Yeah, she's mentioning a report from the Ministry of Health that uh, out of report. six children with yeah, a report out of six children with Zika only one gets care and the. Um, <coughs> <coughs> Ah, and, In the and, and this sector. one, and this one. Sorry, I'm <laughs> tired now. <laughs> uh, 
and out of all and all, out of the swarm, it's generally in the private sector. We need to um, update the discourse. Especially in her state, in Pernambuco state. The children are now uh, going into three years, three, four years of age. They're not babies anymore, and they're now children. And we need to update this uh, discourse, this, this way of thinking. Then we're now going into different uh, challenges, like uh, inclusive education, putting these kids into schools. That it also reflects uh, how much these children were underestimated. that during labor, m most of these women that now have children in their four, three years of age, uh, during labor, they, they receive the information that these children would not survive past the first month. And thank God they did. Mm -hmm. even, uh, even though they, they try not to create expectations for the future. In, in Pernambuco State, in 2007, they had 134 deaths. Mm -hmm. And for Nisia, the Zika uh, not being an, uh, considered an international emergency anymore. She, she'd like to reinforce that the impacts were huge, but nothing really changed. It actually got worse because the time is now, it's been, now it's passing, time is going by. The kids are getting bigger and uh, more challenges. People are now forgetting it's not a social problem anymore. And the difficulties are now going into another stage, but the, the, pro the social problems are still the same. So she'd like to reinforce that in Nisia's talk. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's great. To say anymore. <laughs> I, I, I must say, with this feedback, I've done a lot of these seminars. If you could just the German, this is very special to get the feedback. I will try. I will try. I will try. So, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody for being part of this, and thank you for the video cameraman. I know you. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for the students. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you to the civil society groups who are with us. Thank you for our journalist friend. Thank you for students and staff members. It's been an eye-opener. So thank, yeah, you. Good. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.